Well, as we begin this study of Ecclesiastes, and actually Ecclesiastes is a book that is read during the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. Uh, but as we, as we begin it, um, and as we look at it, there are a lot of tough questions that are asked in this book. I hope you've read through it, glanced through it, or looked at, at your outline. Lauren's still passing those out. I always email the outline the day, at least one day before, so that you can have it and look through it. Uh, there's a lot of questions in it. And, and as I was reading through many of the questions that were popping up in Ecclesiastes, I thought, you know, I have some questions too that I'm not sure uh, what the answers are to these questions. For example, can you cry underwater? <laughs> I don't know. Nobody's ever told me. How about this? Why do you have to put your two cents in when it's just a penny for your thoughts? <laughs> this does not add up. All right. Why does the round pizza come in a square box? How did that come about? This one really bugs me. What disease did the cured ham have? <laughs> and why are we eating it? If Jimmy cracks corn and we don't care, why is there a stupid song about it? <laughs> These keep me up at night. Can a, can a hearse carrying a corpse drive in the HOV lane? And the last one, if the professor on Gilligan's Island was smart enough to make a radio out of a coconut shell, why couldn't he fix a hole in the boat? <laughs> All right. The answer to these questions will not be found in our lesson today. <laughs> but hopefully we'll find the answer to many other questions about life as we study this. And I, I, I want to encourage you to hang with me to the end of this lesson. Because through it, there's some, there are some tough questions. There is some, you know, kind of depressing thoughts. So hang till the end. The good news comes at the end. So, so hang with me. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord God, our mighty God, our atoning God sacrifice Jesus Christ we come to you and we ask for forgiveness of sins Lord cleanse each of our hearts we acknowledge that we need your forgiveness and Lord fill us with your Holy Spirit who is our true teacher guide us through this study in Jesus name we pray amen so today we are going to be talking about a king who had it all. He had everything. He was gifted. He was famous. He was wealthy. And no, I'm not talking about King Solomon. I'm talking about the king of rock and roll, <laughs> Elvis Presley. Yeah, I mean, he had everything, right? He, was, uh, he had so many hit records. It's, it said that he... Uh, he sold billions of records during his short lifetime. He got a Lifetime Achievement Award when he was 36 years old. He um, is one of the most accomplished, you know, guys of, of pop history. And yet he died at only age 42. And his life was a sad life. Yeah, I mean, he had recorded gospel records along with rock and roll. But by the end of his life, it seemed meaningless. It seemed meaningless. And then we've got the king of pop, Michael Jackson. Another guy who had it all by worldly standards. He had sold so many records, had been a, a star from the time he was a young boy with the Jackson 5 and then went on as an independent artist. And, um, I mean, he, he sold more records than anybody during his time by far. And he died, again, too young. And with so much going on in his life, it had to seem meaningless as he was only 51 when he died. 
But there's a little better news when we get to a couple of queens. The Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. Yes, I don't know if you have uh, seen her story, the movie uh, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Yeah, Respect. Uh, Jennifer Hudson plays the, the leading role in that. But we see that she was brought up in church. During her life, though, she had struggles. It wasn't a perfect life, even though, again, she was famous and wealthy and had so much going for her. She struggled with alcoholism. And yet, at the end of her life, she got herself back to the Lord. And she lived to be 76 and was still singing up to the very end. And uh, her biggest selling album of all time was her gospel album, Amazing Grace. And so that is, that is the one that was from her roots and in her heart the most. Then um, yesterday, we lost the queen of country music, Loretta Lynn. And she is someone who uh, came from very, very humble, modest, poor roots, and yet uh, became famous and sold millions of records and set a whole new standard for women in country music. And uh, she was a, a Church of Christ member. She was uh, a, a strong believer that became a stronger believer in her latter years. She was even tweeting out verses this past Sunday on her, uh, and on her Instagram feed. So she was a person who recognized God and lived a good full life till she was 90 years old yesterday. So um, in that, now we are coming to another king. And he is king of Israel about a thousand years B.C. And we are in the midst of his trilogy. We just finished Proverbs, which he probably wrote during his middle years of life. It's a book of practical living, wisdom. Now we're to Ecclesiastes, which is purposeful living, where he's wondering what is the purpose of life. He wrote this, it's thought, during his latter years and then next week it'll be passionate loving so i always like to go through and i'll go through it very quickly this week because it's much like with proverbs the who what when where why of this book the who is it's traditionally thought to be solomon and so i'm teaching it from that standpoint that is the oldest and strongest uh, but there is some disagreement on that i will let you know that but i think as we look through this most of it points to it being uh, Solomon, the king, the son of David. What? It is wisdom literature. So it's in that section of the Bible. We had Job, Psalms, Proverbs, now Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. We have them grouped in our Christian Bible as wisdom literature. In the Jewish Bible, they're part of what's called the writings. Written uh, probably 935 to 931 B.C., sometime in the last years of Solomon's reign and life. Where? Probably in Jerusalem, where his palace and where the temple and the capital of the nation was. Why? To question the meaning of life. Now, you all know that Solomon was the son of David and Bathsheba. He was the third king of Israel. He ruled during a time of peace. God gave him wisdom, and it said that he was the wisest man in the world. And uh, he also became like the richest and most famous man during his lifetime as well. He had it all. So why would he write this book that sounds like, it, that, like he is full of despair when he had so much going for him? Well, I think it's because he was not doing what God had called him to do or had called any king of Israel to do. When we go back and look at the book of Deuteronomy written by uh, Moses, there were guidelines. God had said, I'm going to be your king. You don't really need a king, but at some point in your future, the nation's going to demand a king. And so here's the guidelines. And the first guideline was uh, that you must be an Israelite. You know, choose a king from among you who is a, one of your brothers, not a foreigner. 
The second thing was, do not acquire many horses or return to Egypt to acquire many horses. That was the guideline. Well, we read in 1 Kings that Solomon had um, 40,000 stalls of horses <laughs> and 12,000 horsemen, and he also had horses imported from Egypt. So a direct contradiction to the word of God. The third requirement from Deuteronomy 17 was, do not acquire many wives. Well, I don't know what you consider many, but uh, Solomon, the Bible tells us, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Okay, so uh, got off track there. The fourth thing was do not acquire excessive gold and silver. Uh, Second Chronicles 1 says that he made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stone. Now, if you've been to Jerusalem, you know there's a lot of stone. Every building there is made of stone. Everything you walk on pretty much is stone. And so he had excessive gold and silver. The fifth thing was that the king was to make a copy of the law in a book and to read it daily and to fear and obey God. Well, there's no record that he did that. That we have. So, what we can, the conclusion we can kind of come to quickly is you can have it all, but if you're not walking according to God's ways and God's will, you're not going to be happy. You may have it all on the outside, but you will be empty on the inside. And so, that is kind of where He is coming from. Um, but people today are looking for happiness. They're looking for meaning in life. And so this book is helpful to all of us because it shows us that there are paths that we can take that will draw us closer to God, and there are paths we can take that will move us further away from God. So like I said, hang on to the very ending. Now, we're going to begin chapter 1, verse 1 of Ecclesiastes. The words of the teacher or preacher, your version may say, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Now, uh, Solomon in this uh, is going to refer to himself as the preacher or the teacher. And he, so he's going to talk about himself and then as himself as, as we go through this. But the introduction here, uh, the word that is translated as uh, teacher or preacher comes from uh, the Jewish word, kaholath. And uh, it can be not only translated as preacher or teacher, but as one who is a speaker who speaks to an assembly, who gathers and speaks to an assembly of people. And uh, in this, he says, the next thing he says, meaningless, meaningless. Yours may say, vanity, vanity. I'm using the NIV mainly today, and it uses meaningless, but many translations use the word vanity. Some use the translation, uh, the word translated as futility. Um, and, and so what we see, that comes from a, a Hebrew word that really means uh, like that it is a, just a mist or a vapor. And, and our lives are described in the Bible as just a mist. We are hunt, in the course in the course of eternity, our lives are but a mist, a vapor. They're quick, we're quickly here and quickly gone. And so he's he's going to speak much about the, that. That is just the meaningless of life. It's going to appear thirty eight times in this book. Um, it is going to end on a more positive note. But uh, there's no one who feels that life is more meaningless and pointless than a person who is a believer and yet they've walked away from God because they know what it feels like to be close to God and then when they move away from God, that emptiness is great. Now the person who's never known God, we're all created with a God-sized hole that only he can fill. So without him... We search for meaning. Verse 3, <clears throat> excuse me. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? And so this phrase, under the sun, is going to appear 29 times. It's going to be repeated over and over as um, 
Solomon is looking at life from earth, from down here. He's not looking until later at the perspective of beyond earth and up to the heavens where God is. He's looking at what's going on here on the earth. Verse 4, generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun sets, and it hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And that's a phrase that we've all heard. And, and really, it's true. There is nothing new under the sun. All that we see has just been rebranded, remodeled, uh, repackaged, and put into our lives. Um, so he, he's recognizing that, and he's just kind of in a deal of sunrise, sunset. You know, it's just the same thing over and over and over. Verse 10, is there anything of which one can say, look, is there something new? No, it was already here long ago. It was here before our time. No one even remembers the former generations. Even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. So he's saying, again, even people, it doesn't matter. They're not going to be remembered. He's on, he's on a real downward spiral here. And, and what, so I'm going to give you a little overview of some of what he's looking at because um, he's going to teach that he could not find meaning in life in these things, in wisdom, in pleasure, in work, in materialism, and in sex. All right, so he's going to cover all of these things in these next few chapters, beginning with, um, well, let's look at verse 12 and 13 verses. I, the teacher was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And so now he's going to talk about wisdom, that first thing in which he could not find um, happiness. Now remember, God had gifted him with wisdom more than anyone, and yet that alone was not fulfilling. So he wanted more wisdom. It says in verse 13, I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. And what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also the madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. So he had wisdom, he wanted more. And, and we, re we read that he became, you know, like a person who knew so much about biology and botany and, you know, plant life, all kinds. He read, he studied. He probably had the greatest philosophers of his day coming to talk to him. We know that people from around the world, kings and queens, came to give him riddles to see if he could answer, and he could. But just like people today who think they can find wisdom by getting a, another degree, a second or third degree, or going to a different college for a degree, or find happiness in those kind of things. Now, don't get me wrong. Education is good. Wisdom is good. We need those things. We desire those things. But if our hope is in, if I get one more degree, if I get one more this, that, or whatever, I'll be happy. That's not where happiness is found. That's not where our search should be. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. In this, um, we're going to say that he can't find happiness even in pleasure. 
verse 1, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, he went to a comedy show. Laughter, I said, it's madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine. I tried embracing folly. And my mind is still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. So he's saying, I sought fulfillment through pleasures, through entertainment, through wine. And yet, that all seemed meaningless. That did not bring happiness to his life. Going out and partying all the time, having a good time, that was not fulfilling. Work, that's the next thing he sought. Um, verse 4, he says, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs for, to water groves of flourishing trees. So he became a workaholic. Let me see how many projects I can take out on. How many big homes can I build? Palaces, buildings, uh, projects. Uh, he loved plants, so he planted trees and um, gardens. And they were beautiful, but yet that was not fulfilling either. Being a workaholic, doing great things without having God as the driving force in your life will not bring happiness. Too many people work, 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 seeking that happiness, that next promotion, that job title, that recognition uh, to be written up in a, in a journal or a magazine or a paper talking about what all we've accomplished. That does not bring true meaning or true happiness to our lives today. Materialism, he's going to tackle that next. Uh, verse 7, he says, I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. Uh, we read in First Kings and, and First Chronicles how people would, kings and queens would come to visit Solomon and they would bring him like their greatest treasures. Because of his wisdom and his fame, they wanted to bring him all this. So he had accumulated so very much. And yet that did not bring uh, happiness. And we're going to read more about that as we go through. The next thing was uh, sex. In verses uh, 8 and um, following, I acquired male and female singers and a harem, that would be his wives and concubines. I mean, can you imagine the space it took to house all those women? And uh, all those women were probably very competitive. Each one wanted to have their time with the king. So, uh, just like some people today who think sex is what will make them happy. Um, I mean, he had all the sex he could have ever wanted with all the women he could have ever wanted. And yet, that did not bring him happiness. He says, verse 9, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. Uh, in this, my wisdom stayed with me. So he still had his wisdom, but wisdom that's not applied is not very useful. He says, uh, I denied myself nothing uh, my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. I took delight in all my labor. So he's kind of summarizing these five things. And this was my reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. So he had access to everything, everything. And yet life was meaningless. 
He says in verse 12, When I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly, what more can the king's successor do than has already been done? And he said, I know that wisdom is better than folly and light's better than darkness. But he said, but the same fate is going to come to both the fool and the wise person. They're both going to die. Whether you're foolish or whether you're wise, what does it matter? Everybody's going to die. It's all meaningless. Um, so verse 17, he says, So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I have to leave them to one who comes after me. And who knows if that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil, which I poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome work under the sun. And so he's saying, you know, I, everything that I've done, I, somebody else is going to get it. It's going on to somebody else. I'm going to die. It's going to be left here. And um, it's all meaningless. He, he says in verse 24, A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or drink or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless a chasing after the wind so he is acknowledging here somewhat that it's there's nothing better than to be able to eat and drink and find satisfaction in what you do but then he is saying but i don't have that you know i've done all this and uh i can't get no satisfaction he's saying <laughs> you know and so so here he is still struggling with meaning then we get to chapter 3, the most famous chapter of this. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season. Uh, and a time to every purpose under heaven. I'm reading this from the King James Version. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to king, kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. So this song was first to hit, you know, in about 935 B.C. <laughs> and then, you know, somebody took it and remade it a hit in 1965, The Birds. And that's the version that most of us are, are most familiar with. But Joan Collins also uh, recorded this song. And later Dolly Parton recorded it. And part of this is even quoted in a young uh, Kevin Bacon movie. Yeah. And so in it, does anybody know what movie I'm talking about? Yell it out. Footloose. Footloose. Oh, my goodness. Y'all are good. Yeah. He is standing before city council because the city council has outlawed dancing for the youth in the town. It's been a long-standing law. No dancing, because that makes the young people act crazy and do things they shouldn't. And, um, and so he gets up in front of a packed boardroom of all these people that have been arguing, and he says, uh, let me tell you a few things from an ancient writing, a book. And he opens the Bible, and he reads about dancing from the book of Psalms first. And then he goes to the book of Samuel and talks about David dancing before the king. And then he reads verse 1 and 4 
from this. He says, to everything there is a season and a time to every person, purpose under heaven. Uh, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to go footloose. No, to dance. And so, uh, you know, it, this has become part of our, uh, our culture. This song, it's, uh, it's used in so many funerals and in pop culture. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's something that shows uh, two sides of life, that there's time for one thing and then another. But as Solomon is writing it, he's not writing it in a really fun, upbeat way. It's just like, it's just kind of to him like the monotony of life. And, and that too, to him, is, is, is meaningless. Verse 9, he says, What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on hu the human race. And then he's going to go up just a little bit here. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. And so he's saying here uh, that God made everything and it's beautiful in its time because that's kind of the theme of the song he's just recorded here. And But he's saying that God has set eternity in the human heart. So it's not just what we're doing here in the space of, of 70, 80, 90, 100, or whatever years that we live. He's put in each of us a knowledge and desire for eternity. And he doesn't have the full picture at this time of what heaven will be like but he knows it's more than what is just here under the sun. And he says, and nobody can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Verse 12, he says, <clears throat> I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil. This is the gift of God. So he recognizes these things. Work is not bad. Money is not bad. Wealth is not bad. It's, it's our, but it's not the source of our meaning in life. Um, let's skip on down to a verse um, 18. He says, I also said to myself, as for humans, God tests them so that they may see that they are like animals. So he says, humans are no different than animals. And this is, we're all going to die. We came from dust. We're going back to dust. Uh, so, you know, that little bit of optimism, it just kind of <laughs> went away. And he, he, he says, um, verse 22, So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work, because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? So... Um, then we get to chapter 4. He says, again, I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who, are, who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has never seen the evil that is done under the sun. So again, he's feeling oppressed, depressed, and saying it'd be better if none of us had ever even been born. That's, that's how exciting life is, you know. Uh, and, and so he, again, in verse 4, he's, he talks about it being meaningless, like chasing after the wind. But in verses 9 through 12, he makes a, a statement that is, is meaningful. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. How can one keep warm alone. And so we see in this that, that it's good to have a person, a spouse, a friend, a coworker, someone to help you through life. 
we are not we are designed for relationships we are not de designed to just go through life without uh, friends and family and trying to do everything singly on our own and uh, these verses um, it, it goes on to say verse 12 Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You know, you look at a rope, and it's made of three parts wound together. You try to do two, it'll unwind. It won't hold. You get three of those wound up together. It's stronger. It's unbreakable. So sometimes people use this uh, in a wedding to symbolize the husband, the wife, and God bound together to make a marriage strong. You can think about this also. I talked about accountability last week, having an accountability partner. You, your, your accountability partner, and the Holy Spirit keeping you strong, keeping you, you fall down, you've got someone to pick you up and pull you up and to hold, help you hold life together. Then we get to Ecclesiastes 5, and uh, in this we see that he talks about worshiping God reverently, coming into the house of God more to hear, to listen, and to obey rather than to speak. Listen and have the right attitude in church. And he, he says, and watch your, watch your uh, words. Uh, don't, verse 3, many words mark the speech of a fool. Verse 5, it's better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. So uh, going to church to listen. Uh, don't be making vows that you cannot keep. And verse 6, do not let your mouth lead you into sin. So like he gave us a lot about the mouth and our words in Proverbs, here comes a little bit more as a reminder. Then uh, we're going to talk about materialism, or he is, uh, some more. And that was the fourth thing on the list of things he tried to find happiness in. But he's going to talk about these things again, and he's going to come to five conclusions about wealth, about materialism. So verse 10 um, says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth will never be satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. So first conclusion about materialism is the more you have, the more you want. You know, it's never enough. Uh, you just got to get more to, be, to keep that same level of... of uh, excitement and happiness, you got to have a little bit more and a little bit more. But he says, no, that doesn't work. That's meaningless. Um, the Bible in the New Testament tells us that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And surely, it doesn't say money is evil. Money is not evil. It's, it's not a sin to have money or wealth. It's the love of those things that bring about all kinds of evil in our lives. Uh, Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says, don't lay up your tre treasures on earth. He said, lay up your treasures in heaven. He goes on to say, you cannot serve both God and money. You know, one's going to take us one direction, the other another direction. So, put God first in all things. And we think about... Uh, People loving money as being only the rich, but, you know, poor people love money too and can focus so much more on that and on what they don't have as well. So it's not just a sin that affects the rich. It can affect all of us. Uh, again, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, don't be anxious about what you'll eat or drink or wear. You know, God can take care of the birds of the air. He can take care of you. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Put him first. You'll have what you need. Maybe not everything you want, but you'll have what you need if you put God first. Um, verse 11. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. So his second conclusion about materialism is the more you have, the more people want from you. The more you have, the more people are coming around with their hands out. Hey, has anybody in here ever won the lotto? 
I haven't either, but I've read about people. I understand you've got to buy a ticket, uh, <laughs> which may be why I've never won. But uh, they, have, they win the lotto, and they have relatives and friends come out of, you know, everywhere wanting something from them. And, and so the more you have, the more people want from you. They're always asking for you for things. So he's, say, so he's saying um, that, yeah, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? Verse 12 says, the sleep of a laborer is sweet whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. So conclusion, conclusion number three is the more you have, the more you worry about losing it, and you don't get a good night's sleep. Yeah, the more you have, it's like, oh man, how am I going to keep from losing this? How am I going to keep up with all of this? How am I going to continue at this pace? Verse 13, I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. So conclusion four is the more you have, the easier it is to become greedy, to hang on to it, to hoard what, those things that you have, um, to think I don't want to lose it, I'm going to just save it for a rainy day, I can't help with this person or that person, I need to hang on to it in, ca in case I need it. Verse 14, or wealth lost through misfortune so that they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. So some people just spend it all and don't even leave any to their, to their relatives. Um, verse 15, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as they, everyone comes, so they depart. Sounds like Job. 121, naked I came into the world, naked we're going out. That's why we had a fashion show last week. We don't want any of y'all running around in the between time naked. <laughs> and thank you for being dressed today. Uh, so he's saying you can't, the, the last part of verse 15, they take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. So, conclusion five from materialism, you can't take it with you. You cannot take it with you. Whatever you have accumulated, I mean, you're never going to see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. It's staying here. It's going to someone else. Work all you want. Save all you want. You're not taking it with you. Verse 18, this is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat and to drink and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot, and to be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on their days because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. So I would say enjoy what God has given you. Enjoy it, but don't count on that to be your meaning in life. Some of the happiest people in the world do not have riches or power or fame. But they have the Lord. And they have, they have served him faithfully with what they do have and it brings them so much joy chapter six going quickly through these next uh chapters um verse 12 for who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and meaningless days as they pass through like a shadow who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they're gone so in other words, he's saying in this chapter, only God knows the future. And that is so true. Chapter 7 talks about a good name and a good reputation is to be treasured. We saw that also in the book of Proverbs last time. And, and truly, um, it does not cost anything to have a good name. And it, 
and you don't get that overnight. It takes years to build up a good name and a good reputation, but it can be destroyed like that. One stupid, foolish act can destroy your family name, your name, and your reputation. And so, uh, take that into consideration with what you do in life. If you destroy your name, it's, it's even hard. It took years to get a good name. It's going to take a lot more years to restore what has been destroyed. In verse 8 here of chapter 7, it says, Do not say, Why were the old days better than these? It is not wise to ask such questions. So many times still today we hear and we say, Man, remember the good old days. Were they really that good? I mean, we have a tendency to look back and remember the good from those old days. And that's a good thing. That we forget some of the past that was not that happy and not that good. But there's no need to compare that with the now. Let's, we're in the here and the now. So don't always be looking back like, oh, it was so great back then. I had it all. And Yeah, you're, that's gone. You're here today. Focus on what's good today and always be moving forward. But he says there, the end of the matter, verse 8, is better than the beginning. And... and uh, back in verse 8, um, the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said this, great is the art of beginning, but greater is the art of ending. Let me tell you, regardless of what your age is, God has a purpose for you being here and a reason, reason for it. And, and so... You want to always be serving, helping, working, striving to please him regardless of your age. You have a reason for being here. Uh, I ha there's another saying, finish strong. You hear me say that a lot in here. And sometimes it's the end of a book, the end of a semester, the end of the year. The end of the Old Testament, the end of the New Testament. My point is not just that we finish that book or that semester strong by showing up and reading it and taking it in. But it's that we should finish our lives strong. And we don't know when the end of our life is. But by finishing strong, you have to start somewhere. And it's being faithful to God little by little, day by day setting a pattern a daily pattern of faithfulness to god week by week month by month year by year decade by decade building a foundation and so you go i don't know that much about the bible start today starting out day by day looking at his word building that up so that you can finish strong. God has a plan for you till your, till your dying day. So, yeah, you, you can retire. Retirement's good. But it should not be a, hey, I'm, I'm done serving my church. They can find somebody else. Uh, uh, that organization, that charity, they can find somebody else. I'm done. I'm, I'm just going to enjoy life and travel and vacation and do whatever I want. I'm done serving. Until your dying day, you have a purpose here and you have people that need you. I don't care if you're sitting in a, in a nursing home. You have a purpose to pray for your family, for your kids, for your grandkids, for your great-grandkids. You have a purpose. Never lose that hope and that, that um, act of serving in whatever way you are capable and able to do. Uh, verses 14 through 22 talk about being joyful about prosperity, uh, but learn from adversities, and God made both. 
uh, verses 23 through 29 talk about being wise and don't seek fulfillment through wickedness. Chapter 8 talks about wisdom comes from knowing and trusting God. Talks about obeying authorities for God's sake. Um, again, he goes back to death again. He keeps bringing up death a lot. Yeah, it's going to come to everybody. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. This is a continuation of Solomon's quest and his discoveries. Again, he talks about death, that we all face it. And once we die, we can't change anything here on earth. It's only while we're still alive and breathing that we can make the changes and make a difference in this world. So make the most of the opportunities presented before you while you can. You don't know how much time you have left. And, 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 he's saying, and don't do anything that's not good for you, physically, spiritually, or morally. Chapter 10, he talks about the uncertainty of life. Um, he talks about that life circumstances are not always fair. Well, we know that. We try to teach that to, their, to our kids. But we still struggle with it, don't we? Life's not fair. That's not fair that she has this and I don't. Life's not fair. We can't change a lot of that, but we can make um, the most of what we do have, no matter how little or how much. And God uses whatever even small amount we give to him to uh, become all that we need. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 um, Cast your bread upon the waters, for, it, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or to eight, for you do not know what disaster may happen on the earth. In this, he's talking about invest in life. Invest in people. Uh, you can't just sit around and wait for things to happen. You can't wait to plant the crop another day because it looks like it might rain today. Because it might not rain today. And you will have wasted a day. So don't sit around waiting for the perfect time and the perfect opportunity. Get up and get moving. Invest in this life. Invest in your work. Invest in your family. Uh, be active. Don't just sit on the sidelines. Get up and get in the game. The, uh, the practical uh, insight that is given here r really applies to our spiritual lives. Um, if we wait to join the perfect church in our search, if we're looking for the perfect church and we think we've found it, guess what? As soon as you join it, it's no longer perfect. <laughs> yeah. So find one that teaches the Word of God. This is not your church. This is your Bible study. I want you to be in a church on Sundays where you can continue learning and serving with families, with people of all ages. Um, don't sit and wait looking for the perfect one. Um, and, and don't wait for the perfect ministry opportunity. There are so many ways to serve God in so many good ministries. We try to focus on one each month. Um, a spirit of trust and adventure are needed along with knowledge and some practicality uh, to make it through. So don't let fear of failure stop you. Well, I tried this. I would. I would do that, but... I might not be good at it. And I don't want to be humiliated or embarrassed if I'm not good at that. Hey, you might be great at it, and you might be missing an awesome opportunity if you don't just get in there and try and then stick with it a while. So don't let fear of failure stop you from going after your dreams or the opportunities that are presented before you. Then we get to the last chapter. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. And so he's talking about the, the moving of time and, 
and how time just kind of marches on and how we came from dust and then we're going to die and we'll become dust again. But uh, again, in this, we just to review a little bit before we get to the, the good ending, he's taught us that we cannot find, and he knows this from firsthand experience, we cannot find meaning in life through wisdom, through education and knowledge. All good things, but they're not the, our meaning for life. We can't find meaning in life through pleasure, whether it's leisure activities, entertainment, wine, a foolish behavior, partying all the time. Those do not bring meaning. Uh, does he want us to enjoy life? Absolutely. Absolutely he wants us to enjoy life. And we will when we are doing things God's way rather than the world's way. Work. Um, that does not, you know, work should be fulfilling, yes. It should be very fulfilling. But when work becomes like being a workaholic and putting all of our meaning in life into our work uh, through, you know, uh, extra projects or uh, recognition and promotions and acquiring uh, more and more, it will not bring that true meaning into life. And then materialism, well, Money, possessions, he says. You know, I mean, he had it all. And yet it did not bring meaning into his life. And sex. He had all the sex he could ever, anybody could ever want. And yet that did not necessarily bring love and loving relationships. Um, in verses 9 through 13, uh, we see that, that Solomon was wise and he taught the people uh, that the wisdom was given to him, verse 11, by one shepherd, by the good shepherd, by the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not need anything. We'll trust in God. And, and, and we see that his conclusion to all of this is found in verse 13, the end of the matter all has been heard. He said, I've, I've said all I need to say about all this. And here's the conclusion. Fear God. And we've talked about what that means as believers. Respecting, revering God. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. You know, we saw the fear of the Lord brought up 14 times in the book of Proverbs. And here he's continuing and then ending with it here. That's the purpose of life. Respect, revere God, obey God, for that's, that's our duty. That's our role in life. Verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or bad. Yes, we will all give an account. At the end of our lives, we will give an account. So, what is your purpose in life? At this very point in your life, what is your purpose in life? Why are you here? Why does God still have you here in this world? What were you made to do? Do you see life as meaningful or as meaningless? Perhaps this ancient book of wisdom has helped you gain a little better perspective and moved you a little more in the right direction. I'm going to read a, an interview that um, Rick Warren gave several years ago. He is the author of The Purpose Driven Life, which has sold millions of uh, books and uh, he was the uh, founder of Saddleback Church in California which has many branches and he recently retired you know a couple of, within the last few years but uh, this was before that that he was interviewed um, Rick Warren said people ask me what is the purpose of life and I respond in a nutshell life is preparation for eternity we were made to last forever and God wants us to be with him in heaven. One day, he says, my heart is going to stop, and that will be the end of my body, but not the end of me. 
I may live 60 to 100 years on earth, but I am going to spend trillions of years in eternity. This is the warm-up act, the dress rehearsal. God wants us to practice on earth what we will do forever in eternity. We were made by God and for God, and until you figure that out, life isn't going to make sense. Life is a series of problems, he says. Either you're in one now, or you're just coming out of one, or, oh boy, you're just getting ready to go into one. <laughs> the reason for this is that God is more interested in your character than your comfort. God is more interested in making your life holy than he is in making your life happy. We can be reasonably happy here on earth, but that's not the goal of life. The goal is to grow in character, in Christ-likeness. No matter how good things are in your life, there is always something bad that needs to be worked on. And no matter how bad things are in your life, there is always something good that you can thank God for. You can focus on your purposes or you can focus on your problems. We need to ask ourselves, am I going to live for possessions, popularity? Am I going to be driven by pressures, by guilt, by bitterness, materialism? Or am I going to be driven by God's purposes for my life? God, I know, he says, you did not put me here on earth just to fulfill a to-do list. I know you are more interested in who I am than what I do. The call of Christianity is unlike that of the world. The world focuses on what you can get out of life. A Christian should focus on what they do can give. And then he ends with this. When I get up in the morning, I sit on the side of my bed and I say, God, if I don't get anything else done today, I want to know you more and love you better. What if we tried that? What if we tried starting our day like that? I want to know you more and love you better. Well, Solomon found out that only God could fulfill that longing, that emptiness deep in his soul. And what was true for him is true for us. Only God can give us meaning. At some point in our lives, we all strive for the things of this world, thinking that they will make us happy or fulfilled. But in the end, they don't. And Jesus knew this. He, he understood this deep need that we all have. And he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, girl, he was not talking about physical bread and water. He was talking about the spiritual things of life, that deep hunger and thirst that we all have. He is the source. The bottom line is that God created us for a relationship with him. And we will never be satisfied until we allow him to fill that hunger and thirst that we have through a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we allow Jesus to come into our lives, it brings us eternal satisfaction. And then we're able to enjoy the things of this world, the pleasures of this world, the meaning of this world. But apart from him, we cannot find true meaning and we cannot find our true purpose in life.
So I hope and I pray that we all find that ultimate satisfaction through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is as simple as ABC. A, admit you're a sinner, for we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. B, believe in him, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whosoever should believe, would believe in him would not perish, but have it eternal life and three confess him as your lord and savior for if you believe in your heart that jesus died for your sins and rose from the grave and you confess with your mouth that he is lord you will be saved let's pray oh lord god we love you and we thank you that you have made a way for us and it is through your son jesus Lord, uh, help us to turn away from seeking the pleasures of this world that do not line up with your word. It's easy for us to be critical of, of Solomon and see how he did not fulfill what he was supposed to and obey what he was supposed to as a king. And yet, for all of us, how many things are in your word that we've neglected to do or to stop doing? So God, help us to search each of our hearts, to ask for forgiveness, admit we're sinners, and invite you in to our lives for a personal and eternal relationship with you. Thank you that you are even now preparing a place for us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.